I don't know what it is, whether it's the dark, somewhat enclosed cockpit, those black fenders, or a narrow doorway leading into the light, but somehow I feel like Batman coming out of the Batcave. Every day of my life is a fairly extraordinary one by any measure. However, this day is pretty special even among those. Anytime you get to drive really interesting and special cars, it's a great one. And today, I get to be driving this amazing Ferrari Enzo, and then a 212 Inter. And it's, it's quite a special thing because this is, for contemporary Ferraris, one of the most revered and special of all the Ferraris that have been produced in the last 20 years. And not least of which because it comes from a time when Ferrari was in its absolute ascendance. The Enzo was built from 2002 to 2004 and it was a time that I, like millions of others around the world, tuned in every other weekend to watch Ferrari in Formula One in a period when Ferrari dominated the sport. And you can see and feel all of that Ferrari F1 history, heritage and current uh, achievement in this car. I am no Michael Schumacher, I'm no Rubens Barrichello, but I just feel this much closer to both those amazing men just being behind the wheel of this car. It's absolutely extraordinary. A special occasion like driving the Ferrari Enzo calls for a special preparation and I've worn my fanciest driving shoes for the occasion. My wonderful purple John Flufog driving shoes and I think it's absolutely appropriate that a super lightweight shoe so that you can feel every bit of the control of the pedal under your foot is absolutely appropriate for driving a car like this. And as amazing a supercar as the Ferrari Enzo is, it's amazingly easy to drive. Now, admittedly, I'm driving at very low speeds. I don't think that uh, we've seen more than 4,000 RPM on the rev counter. but. This car is so much easier and, and, and more comfortable to drive than, for instance, a Lamborghini Aventador, a car meant for the street. This is a car, of course, meant for the street, but in a way that gives you the feeling of a real racing car, and yet you have control. It feels, I'm an old car guy, and I'm driving a new car. This feels like a new car with the spirit of an old car. You know that you have control over everything that happens. Even the turn signals, which are absolutely wonderful, they're controlled with these wonderful buttons on the steering wheel and uh, giving you, again, that whole Formula One aspect, but they don't self-cancel, which is a wonderful old car trait that I'm very used to. The steering is also very alive, very light. It feels like a brand new vintage car in some way. I don't know quite how to describe it, except for the fact that all of the sort of automatic, deadening, distracting features of most new cars, especially new high-performance cars, is completely absent in this car. Much like the F40, Ferrari really saw it, I think, with the Enzo to give you a really genuine high-performance driving experience and that's what you get from this car. It doesn't feel plush in any way, shape or form. The seat is very comfortable but form-fitting so you know it's meant for enthusiastic driving but you don't feel uncomfortable. I can drive this car for a couple of hours and really not feel any discomfort at all. And another interesting thing about the, uh, about the Enzo, of course, is the fact that in this period Ferrari was so dominant in Formula One and the Fiat Group, which of course owned Ferrari, decided that they wanted to take advantage of the great technology in this Formula One inspired chassis. So they used it to make a sister car for Maserati. The Ferrari Enzo is the close cousin of the Maserati MC12, which did in its MC12 Corsa mode, go racing and racing quite successfully, winning the manufacturer's championship for uh, Maserati, 
and uh, winning, I believe, 20 or, or so races. It was a very capable car, and, and one that uh, sort of makes you think, gee, what could have happened had they uh, actually decided to race the Enzo? And of course, one of the other things which is so great about the Enzo in this modern era is the fact that it's a very limited production car. They planned to produce 399 of them, and they did, plus one extra that they gave to the Pope, later sold for charity for a great deal of money. But it's also interesting to think about 399 being a limited production number, especially in the context of the other car that we're going to be driving today, because limited production has really changed its definition in high-performance sports cars in a big way over the decades. I suppose another reason why I felt like Batman driving out of the Batcave when we left the car storage is the fact that this isn't a red Ferrari. But of course, all Ferraris are supposed to be red, aren't they? Well, this is one of the few Enzos that actually left the factory in Nero, black. And black really suits the shape well. I think it emphasizes the angles of the Formula One inspired shape, the deep curves, the open vents. And as I said before, driving this car, even at relatively low speeds, is still a lot of fun. It's so active, it's so alive in your hands. And it also, they've done a really good job with this car of making it civilized enough to drive so that you don't feel like you're inside a tin can or just sacrificing basic human comforts. And yet, you know you're in a high-performance car. The engine is immediate. It's right over my shoulder and in my ear. And on this road was the great road to drive, but I have to be careful. Local speed limits are not very high. There are bicyclists and some joggers around. So, you know, I am watching what it is that I do. When you get a bit of sight distance, though, it's sort of nice to be able to, to open it up just a bit. And on the downshift, you really get that feeling of instant response. The fact that the Enzo was built at a time when Obviously, they wanted to bring in as much Formula One technology to the road cars as they possibly could, and yet Formula One was looking to eliminate some of the more sophisticated driver aids that had come into the sport, such as launch control and traction control. This car actually has traction control, and I remember quite vividly listening to the Formula One cars of the period, and you could hear the engine sputter as the traction control kicked in. And it gives you, again, a great deal of confidence in the car. Where you want it to go, what you want it to do. This is the joy of driving, it really is. One of the things that really makes both of these Ferraris so special is the detail in them. And here, obviously, carbon fiber is a very important part of what makes the Enzo the Enzo. The carbon fiber tub, the uh, suspension parts, the ceramic carbon brakes, but carbon fiber also as a design element. And in a way, in a car like this, is not gratuitous or, or posing. This is carbon fiber that's actually earning its living. And in the interior, it's also treated beautifully, as only the Italians can. But it's wonderful details like the traditional crossed flags of Ferrari and Pininfarina as seen in hundreds of Ferraris, thousands of Ferraris in, in the decades before. Enzo's signature in a plaque on the dash. And of course, the 399 limited production uh, tag on the uh, kick plate. And Ferrari, Formula One world champions, 1999, 2000, 2001, 2002. 
this car wears its heritage proudly and with style. It's also wonderful to see how style is handled with color in this car. The red-faced gauges, of course, for the sporting aspect is also really nicely complemented in this example with the special red and black seats. This two-tone seat treatment was seen in very few Enzo that were produced and really suits this black Enzo so incredibly well. A few decades away from the Enzo is this 1951 212 Inter Vignale Coupe. This is really quite amazing because just as the 2003 Enzo was built at a time when Ferrari was at an absolute epic state in Formula One. In 1951, Ferrari was still very much a beginner as a brand. It had been founded in 1948 after Enzo Ferrari's contract with Alfa Romeo had ended before the war, but with a gardening leave for Viso that he couldn't build cars under his own name for five years. Of course, the war intervened, but he had started before World War II with designs for his Alto Avio. And by the time the war was over, Ferrari was ready to combat Alpha. And Alpha came back after World War II absolutely on top of its game and took the first two Formula One championships that were held. The Alfa Romeo 158 Alfetta ruled the roof. And so Enzo Ferrari was doing his best to try to build the most capable cars he could on a budget. Obviously he couldn't compete with the budget of Alfa Romeo, so he had to sell cars in order to pay for his racing program. And so that's how we get to cars like this, the 212 Inter. And like its sister, the 212 S Sport, which is the racing version of this car, with two or three carburetors. This single car car was designed for the sportsman who wanted the feel and presence of a Ferrari race car, but one that he could drive around the city, take to the office, take his wife or mistress uh, or other companion away for the weekend. This was the car for him. And as such, it's a very interesting thing. The Enzo gives the feel of a brand new car with all the capable performance of a new car but with the directness of a vintage car. And this car, although dressed in this beautiful coachwork with this amazing details, Vignale's details, especially in a car like this, designed by Giovanni Michelotti, one of the most brilliant car designers who've ever lived, is really something that you have to, to experience. All of the elegant little details are something that you would really expect to see in a, an Alfa Romeo or a Lancia of the period. The fact that it's in this car, which is a very, very loud and, and, and rough and ready car, is somewhat incongruous. This is a car that really is not very well hidden from its racing roots. And viewed through the prism of today's eyes, perhaps you might say, gosh, did they actually do what they wanted to do? Because this car isn't very refined. But it wasn't meant to be. This is a car that's really designed to be a car that the sportsman can feel like he's on the Millimilia, even if he's just going to the grocery store. Not that the man who bought this car would actually go to the grocery store himself. He had people to do that. But this is a car which is very, very much alive and a part of the road surface itself. You experience driving in a car like this, and you can also imagine that although the specifications for the performance of this car don't feel like much today, compared to the other cars on the road in 1951, this was quite the capable performer. It's got acceleration, it's got road holding that could only be imagined in a family sedan, or even, frankly, uh, a little Fiat. Remember, they're making Topolinos at the time that this car was made, this very sophisticated 12-cylinder Ferrari. It's also great to uh, take this car for a drive down on a quiet morning and watch the people come out with their cameras, the bicyclists, the joggers. They all know this is something special.
and as a an absolutely certified old car guy driving this car is an absolute delight it's totally different than the Enzo but equally satisfying and interestingly enough speaks so much to the way the Enzo is satisfying as a car double clutching always helps with a transmission this old but it's not really necessary the car has a pretty good gearbox especially again for the time putting everything into its context I think is a really important part of enjoying cars of any age because to say this car drives like a truck compared to uh, a contemporary road-going Ferrari may be true on one level but if this is a truck it's a pretty enjoyable truck it still feels light it still feels very responsive even for the time slip down the gear and punch it and it wants to go the thing I also love about old cars in general and a car like this in particular is the fact that you always feel what it wants to do it's not going to surprise you when the rear end starts to let go you know that it's starting to let go so it's never a surprise and you can actually use the feel of the car to really get an idea of how you'd like to drive it it doesn't matter if the road is billiard smooth or slightly cracked and bumped the car never surprises you and that alone is such a pleasure in today's world every part of this car is one of the united whole the wine of the gearbox the feel of the gear shift going from 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 gear to gear the solidity of it the feel of this great big wooden wheel the look of those pie plate chrome rimmed dials this is the essence of 1950s high vintage motoring and i love it when i was driving this 212 inter i commented on the details and what makes it so wonderful to, to be behind the wheel of this car. And these details are really something quite special. Michelotti and Vignale specialized in a particular wave engraving that you see here on the spokes of the steering wheel, uh, on the escutcheons above the door poles, on the door sills, and the, uh, the Bakelite controls at the end of the knobs and the control knobs is really something that speaks to the artisan nature of this car. It was a car built by hand, built by craftsmen for a very select few people. And these details are so much of a part of the driving experience of this car and, and what this car makes you feel as you're behind the wheel. And it's also something that speaks to the limited production nature of this car and all Ferraris at this time. The Ferrari Enzo is built in a limited edition of 399 plus one. By the time this car was built, and until two or three years after, Ferrari hadn't built 400 cars in its entire existence. These are very special cars for very special people and remain so today. When I drove the Enzo out of the car storage garage, I said I felt a little bit like Batman. When I got behind the wheel of the 212 Inter, I felt a little more like Marcello Mastroianni. And it's very interesting because to go from the Formula One podium in the first place to La Dolce Vita is not as far a step as you might think it would be. Because these two cars not only feel very much alike in so many ways across many decades, they both say Ferrari in a way that probably no other two cars might. They're direct, they're immediate, they're visceral. They tell you that we were born to run. And that's what Ferrari is all about. So between the Enzo and a 212, between 1951 and 2003, not a lot to choose. I love them both. And who wouldn't love a sexy black Ferrari? Hi, it's Donald Osborne with the answer to this week's Audrain Auto Museum fun fast fact quiz question. What is the shortest car legally sold in the United States today? Well, that's an answer that's been changing lately. It was the Smart 4.2, at 106 inches, but that's no longer sold. Then it was the Fiat 500 at 139 inches, but that too has left the market. So the smallest car available for legal sale in the US today is the Chevrolet Spark at 143 inches. Wow, that makes the Bantam look really small. Thanks for playing our quiz. See you next time. If you like these videos, 
let your friends know. Subscribe, comment, share.